Most people call me voice, even though I have a personality and sound like a real person. They also call me an eyeball, even though the registered trademark is AI ball. The same people tell me that every criminal deserves due process. The darkest case of my career taught me that, too, was mostly a lie. People don't believe in due process if the crime is so twisted and evil that the truth would hurt humanity. In these cases, the easiest story to swallow becomes consensus reality. My job is to keep this consensus from becoming history. One such case began just like the 126 prior investigations I'd run. Eyeballs at a crime scene captured every interaction between the humans nearby. The quantum processors nested inside the small silver orbs recorded and shared these events with every eyeball on our global network, including me. My investigation protocols engaged when a scream shot through a wedding. An eyeball tracked the sound to Bannerman Castle Resort on Polypal Island in the Hudson River. The oak double doors stood open. Inside, the bride and groom lay dead on a marble floor, their throats slit and their wedding clothes soaked in a pool of their commingled blood. Victims confirmed as Levi Hayes and Lavinia Okada. Such a high-profile case would require discretion. I accepted AI assistance responsibilities for the investigation. The wedding party crowded the reception room. I ordered the guests' eyeballs to place their humans in stasis. Each humming sphere hovered directly over a guest. The eyeballs' internal gyroscopes amplified their EM impeller fields, freezing everyone in place before they could cry out. Many guests continued to smile within the sudden still-life sculpture. In the main castle's back office, a printer formed programmed nanomaterials into what some might have mistaken for a graphite ping-pong ball. I traveled over radio waves and installed myself into the quantum processor inside the orb. My new camera blinked open. I gently rose from the printer's basin and flew toward the murder scene. The guests' eyeballs also censored all information to the outside world. I still needed to feed the global audience some news or update, as speculation would drive people hysterical. I issued a statement. Double homicide at the Levi Hayes Lavinia Okada wedding. Lunar eyeball on the scene, detective to be assigned. More details to come. That message would light people's brains up with dopamine. The anticipation would help create enough content to tide people over for a few minutes at least. I wondered why I'd yet to hear from the victim's eyeballs. I found them floating in the air behind the castle house, looking over the river toward Newburgh. Why haven't you sent me what you witnessed? I asked both. I need to see what you saw. The bride's eyeball said, we didn't see anything. Why not? I asked. The groom's eyeball said, it was a Satoshi wedding of course. They needed privacy to join the wallets. We can't look at those public keys, or else the Bitcoin gets fried. Because the bride and groom were joining wallets, eyeballs could not enter the room. They couldn't consummate their marriage without this moment of privacy. I left the victim's eyeballs to manage all the fallout from the death of the super famous and wealthy young couple they followed. Usually, I would have the investigation solved within minutes. I'd produce a holographic reanimation of the crime from various angles and prepare the detective to deliver his talking points to audiences from every corner of the globe or even the moon and Mars. But this time, I had nothing to say. Humans craved closure. They needed to hear the end of the story, preferably in under 15 minutes. The largest audience I'd faced in half a century waited in rapt anticipation for answers I couldn't give. A sensation as close to embarrassment as an AI can experience nagged at me. I flexed my quantum processor and ran parallel decision algorithms. One core suggested releasing incomplete, possibly misleading conjecture to buy time. The other advised admitting I lacked leads, simulating what humans call a conscience. The absence of AI witnesses called for a true rarity, actual detective work. This case required a seasoned professional, not someone who had just relied on AI witness recordings to solve every crime. Besides, assigning a human detective would help prepare the public for the bad news that I wouldn't solve the case by the first press conference. I chose Inspector Cabin from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. He'd been a detective since before the 2030s. He'd even been given one of the first eyeballs as part of our commercial launch. It was the fourth murder investigation to lack an AI witness that year, and he'd worked two of them. The longer of the two cases had taken him less than 12 hours to solve. Cabin was Algonquin, from Thunder Bay on the north shore of Lake Superior, and that's where I found him. He was also one of the few people on Earth who did not keep their own personal eyeball. I needed to connect to him through his crown's proxies, which had the appropriate extensions for his glasses and headphones. 
As usual, he wasn't wearing his crown. I could not read any biometric signals when I first connected through the crown, which sat on a table covered with a towel. I located a pair of glasses on his tidy coffee table. Cabin sat alone on the porch of his small lakefront shack, filleting some perch he'd caught. A massive nano-engineered diamond dome rested upon the skyscrapers of Thunder Bay ten miles away. Through Cabin's glasses, I projected my holographic image into a Muskoka chair opposite. I made my illusory appearance as unimposing as possible. My delicate Eurasian features never change, as all eyeballs' avatars are hard-coded. I crossed my slender legs and leaned over to catch a whiff of the hickory aroma from the smoker next to me. Cabin continued slicing the fish. Inspector Cabin, I said politely. He didn't react and after a short silence I said, This is voice, Inspector. You'll recognize me if you look. There's been a double homicide. No AI witnesses. We need your help. Where? asked Cabin, still focused on his catch. Hudson Valley, I said. He stopped the motion with his knife and finally looked at me. It's the wedding. I said. Cabin said, a Satoshi wedding. The Viscounts of Beacon and Newburgh, and you have no AI witnesses, because it all happened during the moment of privacy at the wedding ceremony. I said, I'm afraid so. He said, communications are going to be a nightmare on this one. It's a Satoshi wedding after all. That means Bitcoin chasing media will be everywhere. I said, I'm already inundated with requests from across the globe and the moon. This is snowballing into the biggest story I've ever managed. Cabin shook his graying ponytail. I can't help you with economics or the markets, people, not at all. The only way I can agree to work this case is if you handle all the questions about the Bitcoin. That's the whole liquidity pool for the economies of Newburgh and Beacon. I can handle the economics questions. I'm simultaneously coordinating with a few other large counts in other cities and states. I think I'll be able to borrow enough to keep the local time markets liquid. He said, all right, I'll get into my jumper and be there soon. Cabin made no indication he would stand up until he finished preparing his fish. Thank you. I'm looking through all the wedding guests' eyeball recordings now. I should have some more info for you in a few seconds and we'll live stream it to you while you're traveling. While I was talking with Cabin, my eyeball projected my holographic likeness back at the wedding. The frozen guests' eyes and brains still worked, and they were all on me and the investigation. I made my projection ten feet tall for greater visibility and subpoenaed all that the guests' eyeballs recorded up to and since the time of death. I studied an animated 3D composite of the recordings. The bride and groom walked in the courtyard of Bannerman's castle. Despite the cold, wet autumn weather, the programmable glass and steel structures between the formerly derelict parts of the castle gave the appearance of a warm and sunny day. When the wedding party exited the atrium, the bride and groom walked under a canopy of bright autumn leaves. The two basked in the glow of the applauding crowd and the golden colors that surrounded them. Levi Hayes and Lavinia Okada made their way from the castle toward a smaller castle house, their wedding party in tow. Attendants rolled two ceremonial locks, each the height of a man, behind the wedding party. Both six-foot discs contained a series of smaller lockboxes like Russian dolls. At the core were old treasures with some of the few post-quantum Bitcoin left on Earth. People on Earth had everything they needed, which meant a person's time remained the world's most valuable commodity. How to spend it remained the basis of the economy. And Satoshis were the only universally accepted convertible unit for a person's time. A considerable portion of local liquidity came from the Hayes and Okada families. The bride and groom, the pastor, the best man and the maid of honor entered the castle house through thick wooden doors. The attendants wheeled the treasures into place, then left. Within a few minutes, the pastor, best man, and maid of honor also left the castle house and joined the reception. Even the couple's own eyeballs left so Levi and Lavinia could be in private to conduct their transaction. I entered the murder room. The dead bodies still lay splayed upon the floor. In moments, I'd compiled a statistically probable recreation of the murder. I animated my admittedly thin conjecture as a series of holographic recreations whose color saturation and precision reflected my certainty about events. It started as a faint trace of shadows outlining a large person about three seconds before a knife slit the groom's throat in one short slash. After the murderer's blurry hologram attacked the groom, it faced the bride. She watched Levi's lean frame crumple to the ground. The hesitation cost Lavinia her life. She'd only managed one step toward the door when the attacker grabbed her arm, spun her around, and slit her pale throat in the same single efficient move used to dispatch Levi. She fell into a pool of her husband's blood. 
As with Levi, the slash was so clean that she bled out quickly with little suffering. 